Hi, this is Max Paquette. I'm an associate professor of biomechanics, sports scientist, coach, and uh, avid runner. And this is the Physical Performance Show. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Precision Hydration. It's time to stop guessing about your hydration needs and be calculated. Jump over to precisionhydration.com and take your free online sweat test. And of course, today's episode is brought to you by the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership and Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, as you know, we'll bring you the latest and greatest inspiration and information designed to help you perform at your physical best. We do this across a range of our different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, featured performers and expert editions. And as of last week, we can now add the learnings catch episode to that list as well. We hope you enjoyed last week's revision of the many learnings around physical performance that have been flowing since the start of 2021. If you missed last week's catch up episode, as we've termed it, jump back and enjoy snippets from six of our featured and very popular experts from 2021 to date. Now, on today's episode, you are in for a real treat as we share with you a conversation recently had with US-based applied sports scientist and researcher, associate professor of biomechanics at the Human Performance Center at the University of Memphis, Max Paquette. By way of bio, Max is an incredibly accomplished academic as well as applied scientist. Max is currently the Associate Professor at the Human Performance Center at the University of Memphis and the Director of the Musculoskeletal Analysis Laboratory. Max's primary research interests are focused on the effects of different footwear, fatigue repetition, altered techniques, and training interventions for injury prevention and performance improvement for runners. Dr. Paquette has published just over 60 scientific papers and consults for high schools, collegiate and world-class track and field athletes and their coaches to optimize performance and reduce injury risks. And that's one of the things that will shine through in Max's sharings. It isn't just a scientific experience that has been accrued across the years. There's also that very practical application and in addition to the many hats that Max wears, Max also coaches his professional middle distance running wife, Lauren. And during today's conversation, which we're terming moving beyond weekly distance, Max Paquette shares around a commentary that he and co-collaborators published in 2020 titled Moving Beyond Weekly Distance, Optimizing Quantification of Training Load in Runners. And the premise of the commentary was challenging the convention of quantifying running training loads solely around mileage. Max and co-collaborators Rich Willie, Trent Stellingworth, and Chris Napier encourage the reader of the commentary, which we'll link up in the show notes, to move beyond weekly distance because of the many pitfalls in looking at training load in such a myopic way. Consider this statement from Max, your body doesn't know how far you've gone, but it does know how you're feeling. So there has been a shift towards including a necessary shift, I must add, measures of internal workload or physiological response to the training. Some may be familiar with ratings of perceived exertion, which Max outlines today how that can be used. This is a crucial conversation around getting the most out of your training, trying to avoid training errors and optimizing your recovery and adaptation to the work that you've done. Of course, Max lays down a great physical challenge for the week and distills all of his learnings into one piece of advice as per usual. So here is my conversation with Associate Professor in Biomechanics at the Human Performance Center, the University of Memphis, Max Paquette, around moving beyond our fascination with weekly mileage for runners.
Max Paquette, it is a real professional thrill and pleasure to feature you as an expert here on the Physica Performance Show. So welcome to the show. Oh, Brad, thanks for having me. Um, really excited to, uh, to have this chat tonight. Max, I've been keenly reading a lot of your outputted literature as a, as a scientist, researcher in the field of running, biomechanics, uh, injury prevention for, for several years. And there's two papers that really stick out. One that we'll explore today, the 2020 released commentary around uh, optimizing quantification of training loads in runners. In other words, how to quantify training. And the other, the master's running commentary that yourself and former featured guest and professional colleague of yours, Rich Willie, outputted. So I just want to say thank you for the contribution you've made so thus far uh, to my own clinical life. It's been, it's been quite large. Oh, I'm glad, glad you, uh, you've enjoyed it and glad you can use it. Uh, I think that's ultimately the goal in, uh, in science. Yeah, it's uh, where I think yourself, Rich Willie, colleagues, Chris Napier, Trent Stellingworth, who have contributed to this paper, do such a great job. It's one thing to have the science, but it's another thing to apply the science through the field of coaching, uh, practitionership, or whatever it may be. And I think you you have a gift of making complex science things practical and implementable. Uh, thanks for that. I think, you know, among myself, Chris, Trent, and Rich, um, we're all runners. And uh, I know that, you know, Chris, Trent, and I are all Canadian and we all competed <clears throat> in Canada at least a national level. So I think, you know, it's, I, I don't want to sound elitist and, and say that you have to be a runner to, to be a running scientist, but it's just that <clears throat> sometimes the context around training is just more relatable. And I think that helps us write uh, about running science, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And, and to paint a little bit more contextual picture around your world, uh, Max, what does a typical week involve for you? You, you coach, you coach athletes, your wife, uh, Lauren is a professional runner. Uh, plus you've got your academic life as well and teaching. Somehow over the last five, six years, I've, I've started to, to accumulate more hats and uh, <laughs> uh, all, all, all fun hats, I, 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 I'll add. Uh, my primary role, of course, is a, I'm an associate professor uh, in, in a college of health sciences at the University of Memphis. And uh, that's just typical academic job. <clears throat> Very fortunate, though, that, you know, the, the way that my, my schedule and workload is structured is, you know, I teach two courses a semester and then I do research and advise grad students and, uh, and undergraduate students. Um, and I, have, I don't have high demands for grant writing and grant um, uh, uh, seeking. Um, you know, we bring in money from various sources, but the, the whole concept of academic grant writing is sort of not something that is a huge focus, um, which really helps quality of life and stress levels and so on and so forth. And then I coach, yeah, I coach uh, some high school athletes uh, at a uh, club level and then uh, help a couple of uh, collegiate athletes who are between teams and uh, some post collegiates as well. Yeah, uh, Lauren, of course, my wife is a professional middle distance runner for NAZ Elite over in Flagstaff, coached by Ben Rosario. And uh, now part of my day, my weekly schedule or, so, or monthly schedule is to fly back and forth or drive back and forth to Flagstaff. So uh, that just, uh, it just gives more time for podcast listening, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, I, I, must, uh, I must mention, I did smile when you said that your podcast introduction uh, was Tim Gabbett former featured uh, expert of the show around quantifying training load and the acute chronic workload ratio as your first podcast when you're out rehabilitating your ACL. Yeah, in 2019, January, I tore my uh, right ACL. And uh, when I was starting walking again, I, I, would use, uh, I would use morning walks to warm up and then do some, some uh, strength exercises and my routine and all that. And, uh, you know, I would, I started listening to podcasts and the first one, the first one that I found, I, I looked up, you know, performance and injury and running and, you know, yours popped up. And so I, uh, you know, I, I opened it up, I subscribed and then I got, uh, first one that I, that I saw was Tim's, uh, on workload monitoring. So, uh, that is my first podcast. So that was, it's, it's cool to be on now, you know, it's sort of full circle to talk about training load. Well, uh, here we are and let's do that, Max. Let's talk about training load even that word load i think max we're going to explore the paper obviously in full but the word load we spoke before we press record we both grew up in the 90s as teenage athletes that word wasn't used then in in my in my memory that that wasn't in the lexicon of uh training terms but i guess pleasingly quite widely referred to now amongst the community 
what does that word mean to you, Max? Like, you know, you've called the paper moving beyond weekly distance, optimizing quantification of training load in runners. So what does the word load mean? Yeah, I think we, we, we use the word load here in a very broad sense. And I, and I think that's typically how it's, it's used uh, in biomechanists or engineers that are maybe biomedical engineers. They hear the word load and they cringe because <clears throat> they think, what is that? And they need a very specific term, right? Is it stress? Is it force? Is it, what is it exactly? And in the, in the applied world, in the, in the training world, and maybe the clinical world as, as, well, it's, uh, as well, it's more of a broadly dis, you know, used term. And, um, and so I think that's the kind of the, kind of the beauty and the, uh, and the downfall of it is that it is so broad. Typically, the, the way that I think of it is just sort of overall training stress and demands, right? It's, and again, I use the word stress. It could be, it could be used uh, confusingly, right? It could be a mechanical stress or a psychological stress or emotional stress, but just overall, the, what are the demands of training on an athlete? And you can think of this any way you want, ultimately, right? There's various ways to define it, as we discussed in the paper, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I see it, just overall demand on an athlete. The overall demand on an athlete is the, you know, a loose, broad term, as you say, for, for yeah. training load. Max, uh, I've heard you say that your body doesn't know how fast or how far it's going or gone, but it does know how it's feeling. And I think when we think about that statement that you've shared previously, uh, it makes sense. Yet, as runners, the community, there's been this long-held obsession, which you write about in the paper you reference, with distance and mileage can you speak to where that obsessions come from and how and why things now need to start to change to consider the fact that we need to think about how the body's feeling yeah i think the human human nature is to is to simplify things right we're always trying to find a way to to do as little as possible and understand as much as possible in a way, right? And so we use mileage in running. Uh, it's been used for as long as distance running has been a thing, I suppose. And it gets to a point where we get so comfortable with the term and we understand it. It's so simple and we relate to it and we can quantify it even. We can see it. We know how far a mile is. So it, it becomes very ingrained and, 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 and uh, simple to use this. Um, and you know, then you start, it starts to trickle down, you know, that some top athletes will use, oh, I run 80 miles a week or 60 miles a week. And then you see time and time again, you know, younger athletes, high school, even college who are really see or trying to achieve these, these distances in training. And they use them almost as milestones, right? Oh, I, my first 80 mile week or my first whatever. And there's value in, in training volume or training distance. There's cer certainly value there, but I think the idea that we can call mileage running training load is, is just a little, it's just so misleading, I think, in terms of, of really knowing what's happening to the athlete. And, um, you know, again, I think it's just, just culture time. It's been something that's been done for a long time and it's really difficult to change that. And so I, I feel, I, I do feel hopeful that a lot of conversations have been had now around this topic the last decade or so especially in distance running and cycling. It's been around for much longer in team sports, but in running, I think things are moving in the right direction. And I think that's going to help uh, a lot of coaches and even athletes understand their bodies a bit better and, and plan things a bit better. You mentioned there, Max, that to only speak in the metric of distance uh, or volume, whilst as you suggested or inferred there, Max, volume does have a place. It is a training variable that when manipulated can have outcomes on performance but that, can, that it can be misleading. Can you just unpack that a little bit more? Misleading in what sense? Yeah, sure. I think the best example I always use, you compare two athletes, right? We'll start with, there's two, there's two, um, two examples I can use. The first one is comparing two different athletes, and the next one is comparing the same athlete over time. So let's start with, let's say, uh, you and I are, are, are training together, and, and uh, we have the same coach, and the coach both gives us, uh, or gives us both, uh, let's say, a prescription of 50 miles to run. For week one and then 60 miles and 70 miles weeks two and three well for a number of factors which could be uh having stressful academic uh life or stress stressful clinical life you know hosting podcasts and being up late or early uh you know those types of things and then of course um you know the way that you run your mechanics um nutrition sleep so on and so forth for some reason, uh, the 50 miles, 50 miles in the first week might, might be very easy for me, but for whatever reason, it just, 
it affects you the wrong way, right? It, it just it 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 puts you in a in a training hole, as we might call it. But the coach is seeing on the paper fifty miles for both of us, right? So there's no differentiation. And then the next week is the assumption that the fifty miles has had the same effect on both athletes, and you move on to sixty months. And now what you do is you just continue digging a hole. Now, this is a very specific case where the coach might not be communicating with athletes very clearly or very often. And this happens very regularly with online coaching now and big groups. If you're a professional, if you're a professional coach or a high school coach, even with a small group of athletes, that's a lot easier to prevent because you might see the athlete every day and you have this sort of ongoing conversation and communication about, you know, how the athlete is responding to the training. And so ultimately distance alone doesn't actually tell the coach or the or, or well the coach mostly how the athlete is responding to the training right so that's example one two people same training the second example is having the same athlete over time uh and you might say you're going to run 50 miles for three weeks that's going to be a steady three-week block right so you have 50 50 50 and uh the coach assumes that each week is doing the same thing to the athlete and again um, for a number of reasons, it might not. Um, and so you come out of the block thinking, okay, that was, this, this was three low weeks, assuming that this was 50 miles was low for that particular athlete. But on the other end, it, the outcome is, is not what was uh, prescribed or anticipated anyway. So those are the two examples that I would say describe it the most, the most easily is that you don't really know what the athlete, uh, how the athlete responds to that. When there's only one metric being tracked, in this case, distance, there's too many assumptions that'll be made comparing athletes because mm-hmm. 50 miles for max is different to 50 miles for myself. Yep. And then if it's within the athlete, uh, the same athlete max 50 miles week one was, was overall less taxing on you, but week two, you ran into some psychological challenges with some stresses and yep. 50 miles was much more of a, an impact in terms of your, yeah. your, uh, your overall adaptation to that. And the following week, 50 miles, might have been okay again because those yep. weekly stressors had passed. So I think we all get the sense that there's limitations around distance and mileage. I think we can all put our hands up that we've all been attracted to the simplicity of speaking in that mm-hmm. language. Sure. Sure. And I think we could all put our hands up, me included, around chasing the trophies of mileage at times. Uh, I mean, it feels good to pass yep. new milestones or to bank yep. you know, consecutive weeks of high mileage, but there are limitations. Obviously, as a physiotherapist, I see that all the time in manifestation of bone and tendon joint related injuries. But as a coach like yourself, Max, an applied practitioner in that sense, how do you see the limitations of, uh, and obviously you coach differently, but you know, what have you observed over the years with that focus only on mileage? What has it resulted in? Obviously you've probably observed injuries, underperformance. The, the biggest example or the most sort of obvious example is I'll say someone's like, oh, a coach will say, I don't know why they're so tired. They've only been running 30 miles, right? I hear that all the time. And I'm thinking, my first thought was, what happened in these 30 miles? Like, was it five workouts? You know, three strength sessions, four workouts, you know, some uh, plyometrics, whatever, right? It's just, that's the whole point is that, you know, I used to joke with one of my former athletes uh, uh, that I that is now in, in university, you know, I said, I could, I could beat you up with 10 miles a week because the idea was that, oh, we need more. I'm like, well, I, I promise you to, to, to tire you out. You don't need more than 10 miles. I promise you I could give you, I could give you three workouts in one week and you'd be trashed for a few weeks. And, and so that's, that's an example of like, you don't need to run a ton to be tired. Now you can, of course, like if, I could also say, I'll make you run 200 miles a week and you'll be absolutely destroyed for a few weeks. Right. And so it sort of comes back. It comes back to that. It comes back to you know the idea that that you know everything can be explained by miles. In your paper, references that it underestimates and mi- misrepresents training stress and the result in adaptation. Mm-hmm. And I've heard you cite before. Certainly, it's been a theme recurring on for, via several experts on the physical performance show, and that is that we're only benefiting from the training that we're recovering from. Shona Halson. So yep. certainly just logging the miles with that focus unilaterally is, is going to have some limitations. Mm-hmm. So Max, uh, how and where can we start to change this? Uh, you know, I mean, obviously there's different scenarios. There's elite athletics, there's recreational athletics, beginners, uh, recreationally competitive. What suggestions do you have around how we can start to shift away those that are still stuck in the mileage only world? 
Yeah, I, I want to. I'll start from the top. I think I think taking lessons from the very most elite performers and coaches is often a really good lesson to take because they're doing everything they can right to be the best in the world. And so, if if not to say that the training should be the same, but the approach should be similar, right? So, um, if you if you take my comment earlier about being around athletes, we we argue all the time about what's how to monitor things, what metrics are most important, and ultimately. Even as, as a scientist, biomechanics, I can say this, is that if you're around athletes all the time, you are the best monitoring system. <laughs> it's the least scientific thing I'll, I'll ever say tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, I watch professional coaches interact with athletes, and it's absolutely fascinating to see what they're asking, what they're, what they're looking for. Uh, and sometimes they don't even ask a question, but they get an answer, Right. Uh, you take a, a, a professional coach who's working with an athlete for five years, they know that when their head starts to rock back or their arm starts to come out or something like that, they know that something's changing. Uh, and so they can monitor that their own ways because they're used to seeing them. They have a relationship. They have a good communication uh, with them. So if you take that approach and then you trickle down to when it's not like that, then that, I think that's when the metrics come into play. Um, where you, because nowadays, you know, the, everyone's got a GPS uh, tracker on them, a watch or something. Even if you're coaching online, you can start looking at, at certain things. You know, it's not just the distance, but it can also be, uh, the, you know, the, the changes in pace, the, the heart rate, the uh, reported RPE or the rate of perceived exertion or, or effort. Um, these little things that you can do if you're not around to start getting some, some context. And yes, it's a lot of work for a coach. And people say, oh, I have the worst comment I always hear is that I have 50 athletes. How am I going to just, yeah, what's your job? <laughs> I explain <laughs> something. Like, you have 50 athletes. It's your job to be good at coaching them. And so, yes, it's a lot of time, but that's your job. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you start reading comments and logs, you know, you look at athletes, there's a, co there's a couple of coaches in town who use logs and, and, you know, they'll, they'll look at comments and they know like when a kid uses a word, that's, that may be a, that might mean like a, a seven or eight out of ten, you know, effort kind of thing. They don't have to rate it; they just know. So ultimately, it's going to change things when people become when they want to change, uh, which is I think it's our job as as applied scientists and clinicians even and and uh, disseminators of science like podcasts and social media and to continue talking about it and, and having these open discussions and uh, conversations with coaches. Um, without saying, oh, mileage is, is crap and you should never use it. You know, you, you, you still have to be, you still have to understand that, yes, distance, training volume, because distance and minutes are pretty closely related. And minutes is really the thing that, that the human body really understands the time, right? We don't say you're, you're 150 miles old. We say you're 70 years old. These things are going to help. And so that's kind of how I, I, I like to think of it is you, uh, people don't always know how to use technology and you don't necessarily use technology. You just have to be, think a bit outside the box of the, of the mileage and paces and things and think about your athletes, less about the, the GPS watch. Less about the GPS watch. So it's really about trying to identify some measure of what scientists refer to as internal body loads or the effect, if you like, on the body, be it uh, heart rate, effort level reported which is obviously mm -hmm. a psychological perception mm -hmm. of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think, you know, when you, when, you, when you don't include some measure of athlete response or athlete, you know, effort or internal load, which is typically the physiological response to, the, to what they're doing. So what they're doing could be mileage or pace or minutes or, you know, number of steps or whatever. Power nowadays, you know, whatever. I'm still not quite sure exactly what it is, but we've got, you know, all these metrics of... of, of of load and external load and then what what we're missing often is is how the athletes respond to that all right so that's when the rpes the rate of perceived exertions and the heart rates and these types of measures come into play or conversations with athletes those are responses to training and again it doesn't have to be fancy it just has to be consistent that's the big i think the big important piece of the puzzle is understanding the response to training Understanding the response to training, and it doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be consistent. Yep. So you mentioned a few options there, if you like. An athlete recording the, their effort level, and Max, on that, there's a few ways numerically people can do that. Do you have a preference, and can you share around what can be used on the rating of effort, rating of perceived exertion? 
Yeah, I think people are most familiar with uh, sort of visual analog scales of the, you know, the one to tens, for example. And then, of course, historically, the, the Borg scale of six to 20, um, which I always found odd. Like to me, six to 20, <laughs> for someone in exercise science, this makes sense, <laughs> right? Because you see it in textbooks all the time, but the six to 20 always going to confuse me. So I always like the, the, the one to 10. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, there's good research. I think Aaron Kutz has done some great research uh, on uh, how, how the anchors and the colors of the anchors and all this stuff can influence the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the report or the, the rating. Um, and, I think, and I think this is totally true. I think it's important when you're comparing studies and comparing teams and so on and so forth. But I, I really think that ultimately, um, as a coach or, or applied uh, uh, scientist or, uh, or a practitioner, is that this, again, goes back to consistency. Now it goes back to uh, having giving clear instructions of what it is that you're trying to get out of this and then being consistent in how you deliver it. And once you start doing that as a coach, you, you end up understanding that the athlete, the athletes will, you know, yes, they will make a mistake once in a while and they will, they will just, you know, um, half hazardly just say, Oh yeah, whatever for, you know, and that's okay. I mean, that's going to happen. Right. But on average, uh, as athletes buy in and, and they understand the value and, and why you're doing it and they understand what you want from them, they will do it consistently over time. And that's what you're looking for. So Max, it's all about being consistent. Can you give a practical example from your own coaching there with your athletes on how this actually looks? So I've heard you reference an Excel document. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give an example of how your athletes track these internal loads or their effort levels along with their minutes? Yeah, so I, I, I love the simplicity of, of minutes and then, uh, and then an RP of 1 to 10. And uh, I, I, I give all the athletes when they come on and I give them, I show them the scale and I explain what it's worth or what it's, what it's for and, and why I use it. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I have a Google Sheet document that um, basically they each have their own link uh, and they, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're instructed that to, to log on, to click the link after every session and... Uh, with you know about with, within about an hour, and then they they fill out their minutes total session minutes. So if you know warm up everything, cool down everything, uh, and then report their uh, perceived exertion. And then there's a comments uh, cell as well, and they will write down things like oh I stomach was was off today, or well, I didn't eat enough, or something, or whatever I had to pee, or whatever um, things like that. Um, and uh, you know probably about four or five times a week I'll log on and I'll, I have about 15 athletes. So I'll spend about 45 minutes or so just going through comments for the week, like the first two days, especially at the, especially the days, like the few days after hard sessions, I'll spend more time on there. Um, and I'll, and I'll try to figure out, okay, do I need to make adjustments to the next session? Um, that's my main goal. Um, and, and there are times, and, and I'm not saying, by the way, that, and I also communicate with some of the athletes where I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just, you know, how's it going? How's, you know, how are, how are you responding? How are your calves? You were spikes the last few days, you know, like what's, how's that going, you know, and anything, anything off or, you know, so things like that. I also want to point out though, that um, even though I do all these things um, and I, and I often use them to decide whether or not I will adjust training. Um, there are times where I'm planning on this being hard and I, I expect you to be pretty beat up the next few days, but you also have a workout plan in a few days, but that's part of the plan, right? And so, but typically when I do that, then I will also monitor how they respond in the days after that block of training that I know is going to be hard, right? And that's when I really, I will say, hey, by the way, like I know, it seems like yesterday was pretty hard. Your easy run was pretty hard. Um, maybe let's, let's, just, let's just, you know, cut the run in half today or, you know, um, just cross train or take a day off, you know? So I, I use it in that, in that, you know, educating myself in terms of how they're responding and what adjustments do I need to make. It's, I think that's a really important point you make there, Max. It's no surprise if hard sessions elicit a high mm -hmm. RPE score, you know, <laughs> that was an eight or nine yeah. or a seven, like mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. it. That's the point. Yeah. But it's you then as a coach overseeing this, looking at the response to the hard session because that's where obviously uh yep. listen to th listeners of this show are familiar with obviously that's where the adaptation occurs the only training exactly. we're benefiting from is the training we're recovering from right uh and so that's i think that's really uh a great example and a great point max you also said at the start you show the athletes this spreadsheet obviously mm -hmm. they need to know how to navigate it to be consistent yep. in its application yep. mm -hmm. but i think that's can you share it? That's obviously key to have athlete buy-in on why, why yeah. this is important. Why are we asking them or why are you asking them to 
go to this extra effort. They've just done the session. Why do I have to do this? Can you share any experiences around that or any tips on how you get that buy-in from athletes? Yeah, for sure. And I'll be honest, some athletes, um, despite, you know, explaining to them what it is and, and it, think about high school kids. Like I'm a college professor. I, I'm a sports scientist. I do this work and they don't care though. At times, you know, they, they, they just, you know, they get distracted and, and they might not even fill it out. And so some kids like, I don't even do that with them. Some kids, they're just not on it. They just don't always forget. And it's just a waste of time because if they fill it out the next day, like I don't, do I trust the, the reported effort? You know, I don't. So I just, I don't bother with it. You know, I just let it kind of go. And I, and I make a point to talk to them more regularly about how they're feeling and responding to, especially after sessions. Um, and yeah, I, I think some kids take some, some kids buy in, some athletes, I'll say kids, some, some athletes buy in right away and they get it. Like they understand it. And sometimes now that I have this, this, this paper that, you know, I, I'll often say, take a read of this. Let me know if you have questions kind of thing. The older, the older, you know, the, you know, maybe university age or post collegiates. Um, and, uh, yeah, some of them, they buy in right away. They get it. They understand. Others, they're sort of like, ah, I'm not too sure. And then it might take a, a, a little bit to, to kind of, oh, I'm really tired. I was like, well, you know, there's, you know, let's monitor things a bit more closely. And then this is why I do this again, you know, and I'm like, okay, okay. And I start, you know, filling out. So, um, and that's okay. I, almost, I typically expect the first month to be a wash um, <laughs> with a new athlete where they're going to be so inconsistent in, in, uh, it goes back to consistency. They're going to be so inconsistent in filling it out or when they do it, that it's just not worth, not worth really, um, putting too much sort of weight on that. Max. So you've got the data. So they've survived the onboarding period. There's some mm-hmm. that will, I think it's reassuring to hear you say some people just won't buy in and there's other ways yep. you can still try mm-hmm. and quantify these internal loads, conversations, comments, yep. whatever. Uh, but so you've got the data coming in. How do you progress training and workload? It's such seems like such a simple question, but uh, obviously there's a little bit more to it. How do you progress yeah. training? So it's the most it's the most common question, uh, and typically I think it's important. This is why we in the in the commentary the title is is uh, optimizing quantification of training load, right? So we're not saying we're going to optimize training load. We're optimizing how we monitor and, and, and quantify training load, right? So that's, I think that's important to understand. It's very challenging to prescribe training load because as soon as you start saying to an athlete, I want you to run for 45 minutes at an RP of three, well, immediately you're going to make them write three. And so now you're artificially... Um, basically, you're creating their response, right? You're almost preconditioning their response to their, to their effort. So if I say go run with a three, most most athletes would be like, oh, my coach wanted me to put a three, so I'll put a three <laughs> down, right? So I don't actually prescribe training load, but I will. The main thing I use it for to answer your question and how I progress things is I know how a certain athlete will respond to, I, I typically prescribe two like more intense workouts a week, right? And sometimes that second workout will be part of a longer run. So instead of doing a steady long run, it'll be a, a long run with some of some intervals in it, you know. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very cognizant of like we need to maybe do a little less at times in terms of intensity to make sure that we can do it for a long period of time and not get hurt. That's kind of my approach to it, right? Um, and so with that. Um, when I do add a third workout or third harder session in a week, I really spend time monitoring how um, certain athletes respond to that. Some athletes will be fine the next week. No problem. You know, the RPEs are low. They feel good. Others, they can be in a hole again. Um, And then, so I know that, okay, well, maybe this athlete doesn't need three workouts that often, you know, maybe I can get away with uh, a week of three workouts only once every four weeks. Whereas athlete Y, uh, they might be able to handle three workouts a week, you know, two or three weeks uh, a month. So that's how I, I, I prescribe. I, I don't necessarily prescribe load, but I will adapt the training and the intensity of, a, of, a, of a, an intended session based on their response to it. And, and that's the value, Brad. That's exactly what I'm really trying to make people understand is that like, you can use this to understand your athlete's response. And I can't stress this enough. Uh, it's, it's understanding their response to a number of factors that you manipulate. So you're in control, you manipulate the prescription and then you have to, then, then you wait and see what happens. Um, and then that, that educates you for what to do next. You know, 
all right, I know that I can push this athlete more. I know that I can, I need to hold them back, so on and so forth. And, and that happens. You know, I've had an athlete where when she was doing really short, intense intervals, she would be in, like really feeling, feeling it for, for a while. And in fact, last spring, she was really beat up and we had to completely back off. And, and then, but then a nice summer of training and, you know, one of her second race back in the early fall, you know, big personal best. Right, because you know the training is you know as you know training that you did six months ago matters you know and so that's a nice way to think of it is is sometimes you as you're learning and maybe you're pushing an athlete too much it's not lost it just means that now you've learned that you can't do this at certain times of the year <laughs> mm. and at that at that point it was a coaching mistake because i gambled a bit with a bit more intensity and it didn't work but then it paid off later on Luckily and, and uh, unluckily, I suppose the pandemic hit, so there were no official races in the spring, so it didn't really matter in the end. But still, like had I done that during a, a pre pre comp competitive period, that would have been pretty disastrous, right? Um, but certainly, I, I would never do that again now because I have the data and I have the information um, I can go back to. I uh, Max. My seven-year-old daughter, as I dropped her off at school, they've got a big poster up that says, "If you're making mistakes, you're learning." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually true. took it. I wrote that down. I thought that was great. And uh, and so, Max, I think the key takeaways there from your sharings are: it's not about prescribing the RPE. So, as you say, telling the athlete to go and run yep. a ten out of 10 30 thirty-minute time trial. Right. Nine, um, <laughs> it is about monitoring their response to factors yep. manipulated by coaching practitioners, etc. So to dig a bit deeper on that, any suggestions around how you, you know, prescribe the session? Like I've heard some triathlon coaches suggest that they'll never, say for cycling, ever tell an athlete to ride to certain watts, uh, sorry, to ride to certain speed. They might, mm -hmm. you know, prescribe watts or they might just use terms like this is meant to be easy. This is meant yeah. to be a hard session. You know, what do you, yeah. any, any input on that? So I, in terms of the external load, I always prescribe minutes. Uh, I think minutes uh, are, are just maybe goes back to my, my potential undiagnosed teenage 90s kid AD, ADHD situation <laughs> where, um, you know, to me, like if I say 30 minutes, I know I'm out there for 30 minutes, right? <laughs> As opposed to if I say five miles, I could be out there for plus or minus 10 minutes, right? Um, so I, I think that simplifies things quite a bit, especially when you have groups of like bigger groups uh, of, of, of young athletes where you could say everybody goes once for 30 minutes or whatever, they're all back at the same time. Right. And you can plan things around that. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the quote earlier that the, the human body doesn't come with an odometer or speedometer. It just comes with, you know, knowing what, how its physiology has changed or, or whatnot. I forget what the exact quote was, but, um, and that's the same, that's, that's the idea with time to me. It's, um, I had a conversation today with a, with an athlete who is in a bit of a training hole and not quite sure what's going on. And, uh, you know, uh, just, just really kind of confused and, and was, was complaining about, you know, this pace feels really hard right now kind of thing, right? And I said, don't worry about pace, you know? Just go by, go run by yourself somewhere you love to run, somewhere quiet, somewhere you've, you don't often go, and uh, just just feel it, you know? Just sounds hippie, but just kind of feel the run, you know? <laughs> and just just make, make yourself feel good. If that means you have to slow down, you have to slow down. And if that means you have to not use your GPS watch, don't use your GPS watch, you know? Um, and often, some often athletes need to reset that way, where we're constantly being told like you're you're moving at this rate, you're moving at this pace, and your expectation is that an eight minute mile pace or a seven minute mile pace should feel X amount, right? It should feel easy, or it should feel comfortable. Then one day it doesn't because you're tired, and then you freak out. <laughs> you know, so it's just that that expectation that's unmet, um, and you have to back off. And so anyway, so that's uh. That's how I prescribe things. I use words sometimes like go easy or just go for an easy run or go for, uh, you know, go for a tempo. And I always say like, they ask me, what, what pace, what pace, what pace? And I say, <laughs> and I say sort of tongue in cheek, yeah, 5k effort, <laughs> you know? And they're like, what, the, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I, I don't like, sometimes I, I'm, I'm probably a bit too ambiguous in how I prescribe things, honestly. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you're trying to, you know, learn certain athletes some athletes i know easy run they know exactly what that means other athletes i'll say go uh go at a chatty pace or uh, you know you know you can breathe pretty heavy today kind of, you know they know what that means but others like I, they want paces 
So sometimes I will pre prescribe a pace knowing that this pace should be like, I'll give them a big range, like, you know, 740 to 830 per mile pace. And they're like, that's big range. I'm like, yeah. So, if, you know, if it feels hard, then go slower. And if it feels good, you can go down to 740, you know, um, but it depends on the athlete, right? So they're all again. It goes back to consistency and communication, and, and understanding what they're, what how they interpret what you're saying. And uh, I've learned quite a bit uh, on, on that from uh, from my good friend Daniel Greenwood, who's who's Aussie, and he's our uh, he worked with the AIS for a long time, and now he's the director of our Human Performance Center. Um, and Daniel is a skill acquisition person, and he's probably the most the the most well spoken, you know, best communicator I've ever met. And uh, you know, he. I've learned a lot from him, just talking to him, watching him talk to coaches. And so I try to be a bit more specific and clear with instructions, but at times that doesn't always happen. And you have to kind of adapt with that. You said, Daniel, your colleague there is the yeah. best communicator. And then you said, suggested that he's clear. And uh, is yeah. that one of the keys you think of good communication is being clear? I, I, yeah, I think it's it's being clear, but also making sure the athletes understand. So you can you can sound clear. I can pronounce something very well, <laughs> but but the message is not understood because they don't understand what that means, right? Mm. Um, so like, like you often hear the word tempo. Let's go do some tempo. Well, if you ask a hundred different coaches, <laughs> fifty will say a different you know a different definition of tempo. And so again, if I'm assuming that tempo is well understood, then I might be making the mistake, the communication mistake that, that they know what that means, you know? Yeah, gosh. So uh, it's not com completely without instructions. Uh, for example, you know, you said you might give a range of pace. There's, it really, I guess, speaks to the art and science of coaching. There, there can never not be a huge art component. Is that fair? Fair comment? Yeah, I mean, that's ex I mean, <laughs> I guess I suppose you could summarize this whole conversation so far on the, the you know, using the art. It's it's an art to apply the scientific concepts. I suppose, mm. right? It's an art um, to apply the scientific concepts. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the best way I can think of it, yeah. um, because now you're, yes, you know the science. Yes, you're a scientist. Yes, you you're expected to act like a scientist, but ultimately. If you don't figure out how to communicate that clearly and make sure that the athletes are on board and on the same page, you're you're going to be you're going to be you know running into some roadblocks pretty quickly. Yeah, it's an art to apply the scientific concepts, uh, and I also must correct you, Max. You said the most scientific thing you would say was something uh, I can't recall, but uh, the least you, scientific say the <laughs> least scientific thing. But then you did say uh, not too long ago there that sometimes you tell an athlete to just feel it. And I think that's absolutely gold. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. That's, that's pretty non-scientific. Just feel uh, it. <laughs> yeah. but that speaks to this concept of not being too rigid with, uh, yep. as athletes. Yep. And I think as a physiotherapist, often helping people get back to their coaches with prescribing collaboratively at times, return to run programs. Uh, I like to see athletes recovering from injury sometimes almost pat themselves on the back by going, you know what, I'm not feeling it today. I'm not doing that session or I'm going to modify that session. Yet I think as junior athletes, particularly driven ones and plus or minus whatever level of talent, there's often that I don't want to let the coach down. Yep. I, I want to stick to what's on the program. It's going to be good for me. How do we mm -hmm. start to shift that? I think it's slowly changing, but there's still a trophy for you know, for those that don't miss sessions, there's still a trophy for those that, you know, you know, don't, aren't soft. I mean, that's a term used in Australian lexicon quite yeah. often. Yeah. No, we, I mean, we have it here as well, right? I think the strength and conditioning world, which has come a long way now, we have some fantastic strength and conditioning coaches in the United States, but this whole idea of like go bear, go home, right? It's, it's, it's just ingrained in, in young athletes. And a lot of older, a lot of parents are, are thinking this way, you know, a, a kid is beat up. They need to train harder. I'm like, well, actually the opposite. Um, yeah. I, it, it, I think it takes a specific kind of athlete, and I and I'm and I, I go. I think about this quite a bit, Brad. I and I, I think that you know, at the top, obviously, athletes are pushing, 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 and redlining constantly. But at the same time, they're so in tune with their bodies and understand the signs and the red flags, or let's call them the orange flags, and they know when to pull back and they know when to push forward, right? Um, and there's a risk reward there. I think you, you know, okay, like I'm on the verge of something not good maybe, but I just, I really want to do that workout tomorrow. Right. 
And I think the best athletes and the best coaches will, will acknowledge that and maybe say, you know what? Yeah, you probably could. But then if you do and you crush it, and then the next few days you're, something comes up and now you're out for two weeks, now we're, it's completely useless, right? So just that the wherewithal to, to think, okay, let's push one day. Like one day just changes nothing. In fact, three days changes nothing, right? It's just, it, so that's, that's the, the ability of a good coach is to be able to adapt and be adaptable and, and, and alter training for the benefit of the athlete. And that becomes difficult because athletes often might feel, you know, they might have negative thoughts and think, oh, I know I'm not good enough to do this. I'm going to miss the workout and, you know, so on and so forth. And, but it goes back to communication and, and the coaches, you know, really making sure the athletes understand that missing one session in the grand scheme of things is nothing, right? Mm. Um, and, but, but we're so ingrained again in, in the concept of like, you have to work, you have to like, you know, someone out there, your opponent's sleeping, right? You got to work, you got to outwork them, <laughs> right? I, I just hate that type of, 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 of thinking because it's like, no, 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 just, just do what you're, just do what we're, what our plan is, you know? And there's, yes, there are rest days and so on and so forth. And it's okay to sleep. Like your opponent, if they're sleeping, like the, they're, they're resting, they're recovering, they're adapting, like just do that. Um, so that, you know, I think is, is an important thing to understand is just, you know, being adaptable and, and, and moving things around a bit. And, and, um, on that topic, something I've really thought about recently is, you know, this whole mileage thing and volume. And yes, there's evidence that volume is better and, and uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, distance performance, right? Overall volume tends to be a pretty good predictor of performance long term. In the marathon, I think that's pretty accurate all the time. You know, I think there's few marathoners who, who, who can run like 30 miles a week and do a really good marathon. You know, I, I, that, that probably doesn't exist very often. Like even I hear a coach, oh, this athlete ran this well off of just 50 miles. I'm thinking that's still double the race distance almost. Like that's still a good amount, right? Like it's not nothing. But <clears throat> I also wonder that we don't really know. There's very few studies who actually look at small volume and, you know, well-programmed things and different athletes. And so it's difficult to really know um, how much or how little we can get away with in terms of volume. Mm. I said earlier, a 10-mile week can be very difficult to put, put together the right way, you know, or the wrong way, I suppose. Um, and so I, I think this is important for coaches to think about as well. Um, I have a high school co- athlete right now who's in grade 10. So a very young, very well-developed, strong athlete. And maybe he runs like, I don't know, a hundred minutes a week or something like that, right? 80 to hundred minutes a week, which is probably 10 to 15 miles a week. Um, just for the listeners who, who, who relate to miles. Um, but he, he, I mean, he's, he's a two minute flat 800 meter runner in grade 10, which is pretty decent. Uh, and he doesn't need to run more, you know, he just, he just doesn't, uh, right now he, uh, and, and then, but the argument will always be, yeah, but if he ran 50, he'd be a 150 800 meter runner. And, and like, says who, like how, like, <laughs> that's what I struggle with. There's people say, Oh, if you ran more, you'd be better. I could also always say, well, it may be that if that person ran last, it'd be better. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's this ongoing thing about, you know, knowing the athlete and how well they respond to certain things and you try it out. And then this kid, like, if I have him run 45 minutes, he's like beat up for days. Like you just can't, you know, it's just, <laughs> but you can do five, 460 seconds and feel fine, you know? <laughs> um, so it's the type, the type of, the type of adaptability and, 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 and you know, <clears throat> art uh, aspect of coaching that you kind of manipulate and, and understand over time. And you know, I think everyone's prepared to take the, take the risk if you like of increasing mileage to see their performance shift because that's a fairly you know well established link there that more volume can equal better performance but very few people are courageous enough to take the uh take the step the other way and go as you say well how little can yeah. i do to still maintain that performance it's a it's an unsettling proposition yeah and i and i i'm kind of a fan of of this concept where like uh, athletes can cycle from high volume to low volume, not necessarily within a year, but, you know, over, over several year cycles, you see it all the time in middle distance running, uh, an athlete goes to a program that's, uh, you know, focused on high volume and they do pretty well. Then they shift, uh, groups or coaches and that coach might have a lower volume, higher intensity program. And then they have these huge bursts in performances, right? These huge sort of, uh, uh on, they unblock their, their, maybe their plateau or something. And that happens all the time, you know? Um, and then maybe they plateau after a while. 
in that case, I would say, let's shock it again, you know, just bring up some volume for a year and then bring it back down. And, you know, so you can cycle around that, the quad for Olympic games and world championships, you know, those types of things. I think we don't know enough about, and we don't try enough because people are comfortable with what they know and they continue doing that. Um, and I think we're getting closer now with technology and screenings and tests that, you know, we can maybe understand uh, more clearly based on, you know, top speed, like some of the work that Garrett Sanford is doing, which is all great. Uh, understanding how an athlete might respond to training based on their abilities and their capabilities, right? And then we can kind of manipulate things around that. That becomes pretty interesting. A little, little less clinical, of course, but uh, more performance-based. You're listening to Associate Professor Max Paquette on this expert edition exploring why it is that we must move beyond our fascination with weekly mileage for runners. Support for today's show comes from the very good team at Precision Hydration. We recently featured Andy Blow, co-founder of Precision Hydration, on episode 234, an expert edition exploring all things hydration science. And one of the key takeaways from that expert edition was that there is no one-size-fits-all hydration strategy for every athlete. And that's simply because every athlete loses a different amount of salt in their sweat that is their sweat concentration varies it is absolutely critical as an athlete if you're looking to perform at your best that you determine how much salt is in your sweat now the good news is you can do that via an online free and accurate test that precision hydration have set up that's available over at precisionhydration.com there are physical testing locations around the world as well I was fortunate in 2020 to have a physical test done. However, I encourage you to jump over and take the online test. If you've ever struggled with hydration issues like cramp during long hot sessions, then you must find out what your salt concentration is in your sweat. Precision Hydration have gone further and are offering listeners of the Physical Performance Show 15% off their first electrolyte order by using the code PERFORMANCE, all capitals, 1-5 when checking out. Now, following your sweat test, you can also jump on a free 20-minute video call with the Precision Hydration experts and work through a hydration plan customized to you. Now, I have done this process. I'm putting it into place for my upcoming Ironman triathlon debut. And of course, I've got my fingers crossed, but so far, so good in training. And I encourage you to do the same. Jump over to precisionhydration.com, find out what sweat concentration you truly have. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership. Over the years, we've had requests to support the show in some way, so we thought the best vehicle to do that was via Patreon, where if you would like to support the production of the show, you can do so from just $5 per month. In return, we'll grant you free access to all back catalogued live stream events, including Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson, and all upcoming live stream events, including upcoming UK-based sports dietitian, Rini McGregor, with a live stream around fueling for endurance sports. So jump over to patreon.com, search for The Physical Performance Show, and there you can support the show's production. And of course, today's episode is also brought to you by Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. If you are an athlete struggling with joint, tendon or bone related concerns, then you can find support online in a very effective and accurate way through Pogo Physio's 45-minute telehealth online consultations. Join athletes, runners worldwide, interstate within Australia, getting back to their physical best through appropriate exercise prescription, injury diagnosis, and training load guidance to see you get back to your physical best. Jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured expert, Max Paquette, Associate Professor at Biomechanics, the Human Performance Centre, the University of Memphis, on this expert edition, exploring why it is that we must move beyond our obsession with weekly mileage when it comes to quantifying our training load. Max, uh, I, I did think of a story I heard this week in the clinic, which which suggests that things are shifting in the nineties. I remember misbehaving at a triathlon camp and being punished with a set of 10, 400s uh, after a long ride. That was the punishment. And uh, one of the athletes this week said, well, one of the leading coaches in the sport of triathlon worldwide, if someone does 
misbehaves probably not the right word, but needs a little bit of you know conditioning. Uh, they might with remove a session as a form of inverted commas punishment. And I thought that was quite interesting, quite a shift from the nineties to twenty twenties. <laughs> That's probably worse for an elite athlete, right? It's like you're t- what you're, you're doing. Why you're taking a session away? That might that <laughs> yeah. might do more psychological damage than anything else. Uh, Max, Max, just yeah. practically uh, before we just talk about the future of training load quantification, yeah. where it might go, does it need to change? You've got, your, you've got your units of work at the end of a week. So an athlete's been tracking, say, their five runs and they've multiplied their zero to 10 rating of perception of perceived mm-hmm. exertion against their minutes on their legs running. Uh, so you've got your total workload units at the end. As a coach, as an applied scientist, what role do you see with things like the acute chronic workload ratio? Obviously, we mentioned Tim Gabbett's work. Uh, he's the first to put his hand up and say, this isn't the recipe for everyone. It's just a, it's a tool. But any suggestions around what you then do with those units at the end of a week, like practically? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'll start by saying I think I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a big Tim Gabbard fan. I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that the acute chronic workload ratio is is the uh, the holy grail. I just, as as a human being, uh, and and what he's done, and and uh, how well he's communicated some of these concepts, I think is is outstanding. And I and I was fortunate enough to you know meet Tim uh, years ago when he when he consulted with the Grizzlies here in town and met up for coffee. And I, I just thought it was so, so nice and thoughtful of him. I sent him a quick message. Like, hey, Tim, I'm some random dude somewhere in Memphis and I'd love to have a coffee with you. And he said, yeah, sure. I'll meet you at, you know, whatever. And so he was a guy who's jet lag coming from Australia and, you know, meets me at a coffee shop and, uh, uh, you know, I missed a busy work week. And, and so anyway, it's just, you know, just, just nice guy. So I think the, uh, the whole, the whole idea, I think for me is, I'll start by saying just the idea of monitoring a week to me is is kind of odd. Like, why do we measure a week? The same way where we work for five days a week, right? <laughs> because that's what everybody does. It's just kind of what we do. Um, but but physiologically or from a training standpoint, like one week doesn't really make that much sense, right? Like he, we know that adaptation takes time. And so this is one of the reasons why I think the acute chronic workload ratio, you know, just really took off because it makes sense to compare what you've done in the past to what you're doing now uh, and what you've done in the past, potentially maybe, you know, even three weeks before the week that you're currently monitoring. But even then, I think sometimes I'll monitor like day to day. I'll look like today compared to the last four days or five days or, or, or two weeks, you know, just, just for, especially when there's, especially when there's something that's coming up and I want to make sure I'm not doing something silly and I, I really want to monitor things properly. I'm going to look at different ways to do it. And it's not, I'm not trying to fudge things or, or, you know, you know, uh, um, I guess support my own bias hypotheses of what might happen. I'm just trying to understand how certain athletes respond and, and if I'm looking at the right things and, uh, ultimately performance is a big driver if someone has a good performance, I'm going to look at the data before that every which way to figure out what part can maybe tell me why uh, and, and how I can use this in the future. I don't care what the, what, I don't care what the averages and papers say. I'm going to look at that particular athlete and I'm going to use sort of solid base physiological basis for, for, for my, the way I guide my, my investigation, if you will, that's right? the small science experiments, basically. Um, and the human body and its adaptations are random at times, um, and they're unpredictable and variable. And so there was a paper that was done, and, and I'm not trying to, I don't want to just sort of call them out and talk negatively, but there's something about, there was a random sort of statistical model that was created, and it, it had sort of did the similar thing as the acute chronic workload ratio or some something like that. And I'm thinking, yeah, of course, I mean, that's just how the human body is variable, and it is kind of random at times, and... Um, <laughs> So I, those types of things sometimes like it frustrates me because I find that to me the acute chronic workload ratio. Um, I even you know I even gave a talk about injury one time and I use a totally different term for it and nobody flinched because it wasn't called the ACWR, right? I just said the uh, the uh, I think I called it like the twenty eight day average um, versus this week or something and nobody said a thing. It was just the silliest thing. And I kind of had a bet with a friend, like, like nobody's going to say anything because they're not seeing the, the old bad ACWR. Um, but, you know, to me, that whole concept is like, you know, I think Tim was, was, you know, using something that's been around for 50 years, right? The whole concept of fatigue over fitness. 
And uh, I talk to my athletes about this all the time. I'm like, you're very fit. Like they finish a workout or a race and they didn't have a good race or a good workout. And I say, you're very fit. You're just more fatigued right now. Mm. Um, and that could be on me. That could be on you. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep or you're you know, partying or whatever, but your fatigue is overshadowing your fitness right now. And we got to basically shift that balance of fatigue and fitness. And to me, that's kind of what it does, right? It's, it's, yeah, it might not be perfect. The number of weeks you use for the, for the chronic or the, or the fitness aspect might not be perfect. And I think this probably could be individualized. Um, some athletes adapt more quickly than others. Some of them take, others take longer to adapt. And so you have to change those, those, uh, those periods. But ultimately, it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's a good basis to start asking questions for your own athletes and your own practice or, or coaching, right? That's, that's just it. Um, people get too caught up in the numbers and what it does mean or doesn't mean. Um, and I've said that on Twitter before and I had some backlash, you know, some, some well-respected sports scientists who, uh, who just don't like the, the concept and that's fine. That's fine. I'm just saying you, you know, you can, you can use this to, to, to your own advantage, uh, if you're actually diligent and spending time, uh, using this individually for your athletes. Yeah. So it has some, I share the same view. It has some applicability, but once again, we ask athletes to not be too rigid, I think as yeah. practitioners, sometimes we need to uh, apply that own uh, that own advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think I mean, it, and again, I just to clarify, not necessarily using it for injury per se, and I think that's where the most of the the issues came from. But uh, just from a from a general you know, training adaptation standpoint, you know, and monitoring training, I think it makes some sense. And and um, from an injury standpoint, it, I think often it's. And I and I've I've said this years ago. I was at a track meet in Oregon, and I, I said this to a to a friend, and I said, uh, you know, this is probably I don't know maybe eight years ago, and I said, um, I mean, think about my my wording is like, yeah, good training is is um, is sort of not sexy, but uninterrupted training, right? Unimpressive, but uninterrupted training is really what it ends up being. And I I'll take I'll take uh, the removal of a hard workout. Mm-hmm any week so that I can make sure that the next week the athlete is healthy and, and enable to train still, right? Cause you don't get, you don't win races from training for a week. You win races from training for years. Um, and this is where for me, I think that the lower volume can come into play. Yes. You're not training as much overall, but I could also argue that in the long term, if you spend 12 years, never being interrupted, as opposed to 12 years of training and three years of injuries, the lower volume over the course of your career per week will be as much over a lifetime than if you train higher per week, but were interrupted for three or four years. That makes me think of obviously US legend Bernard Legat, who yeah. has never logged huge miles yet. Is there anyone that's had a greater career for, for as long as Bernard? Uninterrupted. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I like and that. And, and, and sometimes, again, it goes back to a conversation. Like it's hard to say, you know what? You know, you talk to a 16-year-old. Let's just have you run, you know, five times a week, you know, maybe, you know, 100 minutes or 150 minutes or three or 30 miles a week or whatever. Um, but we'll do that for 12 years. <laughs> yeah. like, try to explain that to a 16 year old you know it doesn't quite work out that way so it's just kind of how it is and that's the culture right the ncaa in the u.s is a big driver for more training in high school mm-hmm. um so that's one of the things that drives these ingrained ideas of mileage and you know the rushing and the you know let's get things up before they go to college they get scholarships so on and so forth so yeah yeah it's uh there's a lot of cultural uh factors there as well max mm-hmm. uh the future of training quantification workload quantification what what where might this this go there's, there's one limitation i see as a physiotherapist working in, in the applied sense max and that is particularly in the case of i think about bone repeat bone stress injuries which is a real passion of mine mm-hmm. uh, it would be very useful to have some ability to quantify internal bone loads uh alongside rpe and minutes yeah. on people's legs i mean um we, we know that there's a difference between the, the good old ground reaction forces and what's actually going on inside a mm-hmm. runner's bones. Now, of yep. course, we can apply this to tendons and joints. But, Max, where, where might we see things trend and do they need to change? Does it need to change? I think there's two different questions there and I'm going to try to <laughs> Sorry, Max. separate them a little bit. The first question, I think, is where are things trending? And the answer to that is a whole lot of wearable stuff. 
Uh, and, and my answer will not be uh, what most might expect, but I don't think that that's the solution. Um, I think that, yes, I think most of the research is showing that the more sensors we put on, the better we can, we can estimate things like, uh, you know, bone stresses and strains and things like that, uh, which is very cool in, pre in, in, in theory and in science and in labs and things. But I haven't been a runner um, since I was 16, 15 years old. Um, so nearly, you know, over 20 years now. Um, I, I have never, I, have, I got a GPS watch last summer, the first yeah. time. And, uh, and I know I'm an anomaly here. Um, I've, I have worn uh, foot pods uh, at times just to test them out. A couple of companies and things that would reach out and I would try them out. Um, but ultimately, if you're, thinking if people are thinking that three or four sensors on the foot the tibia and the pelvis and the watch is going to be the way to the future i think we're a bit delusional frankly um the simplicity of running is is what makes running is you put on your shoes and you put on your, your wristwatch and you go you know run um i actually think that the next big breakthrough and, and i'm not an engineer or anything like that um but some type of portable, fairly inexpensive way to um, be able to image bone or tissue, um, mm -hmm. a handheld type device, basically, which we're not quite there yet. Obviously, the technology is not there, but not monitoring while running, but monitoring after running. It goes back to the response to the running, mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately it doesn't really matter if we can estimate bone stress mm -hmm. if the if the response to that stress is positive, <laughs> you know, um, so if we if we can monitor the the, the response to the bones, uh, basically the, the remodeling and the adaptation of the bone in the days or, or you know several days following or weeks following, um, this is where we will make progress. So I've for years now I've been saying like I, I, I tell this as many people as I, I, I as I meet because if someone's this brilliant person like maybe like a <laughs> Nikolai Tesla or something uh, type level of of intelligence, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm picturing like. Um, Almost like a, uh, um, yeah, like a, not a remote, but like a little handheld device that you can like slowly move over the tibia. And like, we know the at-risk regions, right? Yeah. Um, and so let's say it's a 10-second scan, boop, distal, you know, medial tibia or on the right side, boop, distal, medial tibia on the left side, a couple of metatarsal shots, maybe a, maybe a you know, proximal femur or something. Um, and th there you go. You know, it takes maybe two minutes. I mean, that would be... That's, that, to me, is a future of bone stress uh, injury prevention or at least the monitoring. And if anyone out there uh, has the, uh, the smarts, do reach out to Max and uh, I'll put call. my hand up to buy the first unit. I will, I will <laughs> invest in that. I will put all my savings in that in my house on it, I think. Uh, <laughs> that'll be that'll, – because, again, of course, if you can do that, then it applies to all the sports, right? The NBAs, uh, everything else. But in running, it would just solve a lot of problems. But so anyway, so I not, not to be a Debbie Downer on the wearable tech stuff, I just don't see it happening. Um, I just don't. And I think uh, it's one of those things where it's going to get really hot. The topics are going to be really uh, sexy and, and important now, and then it's going to die off a little bit. Um, and, I, you know, we have papers in wearable tech, and I'm proud of them. And I think it's, it adds to what we know, but I think it also mostly tells us how far away we are from being able to do this realistically in the applied setting. It goes back to our conversation about, you know, being involved in running and knowing, how, knowing runners and behaviors and, and uh Yes, I'd love to prevent bone injuries in people who run 10 miles a week, but ultimately those people aren't making a living off of it. Uh, and so, um, you know, they can just stop running. <laughs> they can or not stop running, but they can do less, for example, right? And, and, and I'm not one to say stop running, yes. but if you're running 10 miles a week, um, you know, and that's your thing, great, and you want to keep doing that, um, there's a good chance that you can do that pretty safely, you know? <laughs> um, I think the big issue is, is trying to get people to do, if people are trying to do more or make a living of it or making a, a national team, you know, win more Olympic golds. Like that's kind of my, where my interests are. Like I'm looking for more of the performance aspect and again, uninterrupted training. And so ways to, to, to ensure that. And we're not there yet. It's, but it's exciting. There's, there's hope. It's just not, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's where we think it's going to come from in the yeah. wearable industry. Someone asked me yesterday, Max, if it's possible for a runner to run their whole career and never get injured. And it was an interesting question. I think mm. it's possible, but very unlikely if that yeah. athlete is pushing for performance. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, 
I train, I will say I'll train competitively probably between the ages of 17 and 26, I will say. So, you know, near 10 years where I was training, I was training to compete. Um, and in that time period, I had an ITBS uh, issue once, but it also happened uh, after I had a pretty brutal fall in the winter and I fell on my, on my left hip and, uh, I had some issues uh, that, that occurred, and then almost immediately I started having some, some ITBS syndrome or uh, symptoms. And so to this day, I still think it was related to the fall. I don't quite know how, the mechanism, but something happened to it, uh, and that really triggered it. Um, and, but that was the only injury I've ever had. I never had a stress fracture. I never had Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, none of that. Never had any of that. Um, and so... Uh, and I've, you know, I, I, I train well, I like, a, you know, 10, two or three workouts a week and, and long, long sessions. And, um, and so I, I think it was just, uh, I may, I may be one of those anomalies of, you know, people that don't get hurt now, of course, between 26 years old to 36 now, um, <laughs> I have had a bunch of calf issues and things. And that's mostly because have you I'll read your it. own paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's mostly because I go to the track on a Thursday, like last week and uh, help a friend do 12 quarters. And, and I do, I, I would do 12, 200s, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so far so good. No issues now, but, uh, yeah. You're listening to Max Paquette, Associate Professor, Biomechanics, the Human Performance Center, the University of Memphis, outlining why it is that we must move beyond our fascination with clocking weekly mileage as runners and begin to include better ways to quantify the true training load. Now, if you missed last week's episode, it was a catch-up episode. We called it a learnings catch-up episode where we took a look at some of the top themes and learnings that we've taken that have been shared by our experts thus far in 2021. The Catch Episode episode is available across all podcast platforms and now also over on YouTube. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured guest, Associate Professor Max Paquette on this expert edition, Moving Beyond Weekly Mileage for Training Load Quantification. Max, I must ask before we throw to the final two questions, you've been very generous with your time and your, your, your sharings. Something I, one of you, your co-collaborator on this uh, this training workload paper, Rich Willey, collaborated with several other scientists around is the recent publication of preventing bone stress injuries in runners, mm-hmm. and they cite the concept of intensity creating greater magnitude or strain on the bone, and therefore being a potentially greater risk of bone stress injury than than volume alone, or, or minutes or, or time, uh, and they cited to consider. If you prescribe more intensity in a runner's program, considering reducing the volume for that week, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's an impossible question in some sense, but just interested in your thoughts around, I think a lot of athletes, coaches, practitioners will say, right, we've got to increase volume and we need to increase intensity and we're throwing it all into the mix at once. But as an athlete, unfortunately, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I've had maybe half a dozen bone stress injuries in the last six, 10 years of uh, recreationally competitive triathlon running. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm now very wary of intensity and where I do and don't place that. Can you just speak to intensity and, and distance? Yeah, I love that question. I, I do this for, with everything. I do this with strength training, volume, uh, you know, intensity of sessions or number of intense sessions, frequency of, of sessions, and then uh, plyometrics and drills and things. So I, I make sure when I introduce a new phase in strength training, the volume might come down. And people think, well, well you know, the running is way more important. Yeah, sure. But again, it's about... In, about making sure training is uninterrupted. And so if, if I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of volume to make sure they can really hit the strength, the strength training well, um, and, and not r- maybe increase the risk at the same time, I don't know if it's going to cause an injury. I don't, you know, no one does, but at least I might think that if I do this, I, I, I'm reducing injury risk, right? I'm at least helping my, helping the athlete stay healthy in some way. Um, same thing with the with the sessions. If if we have a if there's a big training volume, one thing I love to do is if there's a big training volume session or week, I mean, they might do a hard session on Wednesday, and instead of coming back and doing a hard session Friday or Saturday and a long run Sunday, I'll combine the long run with a workout on Saturday. So I'll do Wednesday hard long session Sunday or Saturday, but it's also a workout, right? Uh, with intervals, mm. but then there's no long one on Sunday. And I, and I kind of stole that from Ben Rosario, the coach of uh, NAZ elite, where he works on that sort of two week cycle 
And, uh, you know, his, I love, I love to hear Ben talk about training He's so passionate and he just loves it so much. And he's so clear and again, good communicator. And, you know, he will do their, their, uh, their cycles go, they go, um, you know, Tuesday, hard Friday, hard long run Sunday. Then they come back and go Wednesday hard and then Saturday long and hard. And they repeat the two week cycle like that. Mm. So there's always quite a bit of time in between hard sets. So I love that model because you can, on those weeks where you have a hard session Wednesday and a, and a, and a long and slash hard session Saturday, you can increase overall volume, but the intensity is a bit less because you're kind of bringing things together. Um, and so I, I, that's a nice approach, I think, to manipulate things. But yeah, I, I, will, I will decrease volume if intensity goes up and I will increase volume if intensity goes down. But I'll also do the same with strength training or plyometrics or drills or things like that. So it's not just volume and intensity, but it's other aspects of training as well. I guess it speaks to that concept of being adaptable, uh, yeah. thinking about the overall loads. And it's certainly, yeah. as you've clearly outlined today, far more than just the weekly distance covered. Yeah. And, and, and from, from that, that paper that you mentioned from, uh, uh, from Stu Warden and Rich and uh, Brent Edwards, um, you know, I, it's such a great paper. Uh, I mean, it's probably one of my favorite of all time and it's only a few weeks old. Uh, <laughs> and I know it's been in review for a long time and, and they were happy to get it out. And, uh, and I think if, if, if a coach or even a clinician really immerses himself in, in that paper, there's a lot of good takeaways on how to manipulate training variables and, and what to include and, and when and how and so on. And so I think it becomes, you know, for me, the, the big take home for me with this is like runners run, runners, you know, run fast, they run long, uh, but incorporating like, you know, athletic movements, you know, drills and things like that side to side, you know, back and forth. Uh, I think that's the aspect that a lot of people like miss um, in, in, in a whole training program. Um, and a lot of professional athletes, they do drills and, and plows and hurdles and things, but unlike what people believe, it's not for form necessarily. It's just to be more athletic. Um, you know, that's what that's what Ben Rosario says as well. It's just he talks about being more athletic. And I, I had a nice chat with him a few weeks ago in the happy hour sessions, and he, uh, you know, he just talks about making athletes runners more athletic. We all know that if there's a one group of athletes that need to be more athletic, are runners. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it makes total sense. You know, it's just absolutely makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. I agree with it. It's a, it's a very uh, significant contribution that paper to to the the world of training yeah, and, and performance yeah. and and clinical care. The clinical yep. care setting. Max Paquette, Every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. What is Max Paquette's physical challenge going to be? Well, my personal physical challenge is probably not practical for most people. So I will use a different one. I will say, uh, for me, it's, it's, I, I, I hate walking, but I love walking in the morning to start my day, even if I go for a run or something. So I think a, like a steady walk at a set time of the day to me, that's like my big break. Like that's my, it's not a challenge that makes you more fit necessarily, but it certainly makes your mind clearer. Um, and I'll just log off, like no, no phone. I might take the dog out. And it's just one of those times of the day that I just feel healthier, fitter, uh, and sort of all the thinking goes on, right? Um, so that's what I would, I would say is, is just, you know, if people for one week even just try it out and they might be, oh, I want this part of my schedule now. My personal challenge, though, as I mentioned, was uh, I have a basketball hoop in the back and I'll once or twice a day, if I'm working from home, I'll go out there and shoot 100 hoops, 100 free throws. 100. 100 it takes about 25 <laughs> minutes 30 minutes something like that but if you want to be stay focused on something outside of like social media or work <laughs> yeah. take 100 free throws the focus necessary for that will, will, will distract your mind pretty quickly but you know it's not just about volume max <laughs> it's not uh, but it's also about quality so i'm, I'm hovering between about 75 to 83 percent so that's pretty wow. good for, uh, for a non-basketball uh, player for a runner for a runner yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, uh, that's, uh, so that's great well uh <clears throat> i guess people could choose between the, the morning walk challenge or the uh, 100 hoop challenge if they yeah that's <laughs> If they have access, Max, uh, every guest distills their career learnings, which is very challenging, into one piece of solitary advice to help listeners perform at their physical best. So if Max Paquette had to distill everything down, what would his solitary piece of advice be? Yeah, just challenge your thinking. That's challenge right. your yeah. thinking. Yeah. Like I, I, I go back 10 years from, from ago and I'm thinking, wow, I, I, I believe that then. And I know like I would never do that now, you know. 
uh, just, yeah, challenge your thinking. I think that's probably one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten when I was younger and from a high school teacher, actually, he was a good friend now, still was my high school coach. But if you challenge the way you think to me, it's just, uh, constantly you're, you're basically questioning what you're, what you're doing. And, uh, eventually, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't and you move on and do something else. Gosh, yeah. that's, that's beautiful, simple, uh, but profound challenge your yeah. thinking. Max, you are one of my favorite follows on Twitter. So I would recommend <laughs> everyone it. jumping over and following. And it's such a unique handle, Biomech Max. Uh, it stands out on Twitter. Uh, yeah. You're active on there. You share some great resources and contribute so well there. Uh, where can people find you and, and find out if, if is there, are there any studies coming up you need participation around? Yeah, Twitter Twitter's probably the best way I think to communicate. I mean, the number I, I can't I can't count the number of collaborations and, and friendships that I've developed over Twitter over the last, you know, five, six years. I think people are uh uh it, it just it makes it more friendly than an email, I suppose, although emails are fine as well. I love emails. I'm still like an email person and I always will be. I can't I do text very poorly or at least I can't I, I don't know how to I don't know how to keep track of text often because there's no unread button somehow and it really really makes me go mad. But yeah, um, you know, just my, uh, the, I mean, Twitter is the best way. And I'm always happy to jump on Zoom calls. And I've had, you know, conversations with friends that I've made over Twitter and colleagues and papers have come out. And uh, we don't have any studies that are online per se at the moment, but we have some really cool uh, studies coming out soon. Some, a lot of running work on uh, strength training for, for master runners, which uh, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to chat at some point. One of my master students, Zoe Kearns is doing that. And then we have uh, another footwear study in, in runners over 60. So we're l- manipulating bending stiffness of shoes and, and uh, seeing how, you know, we know how young runners respond, but now we're seeing how old runners respond to that sort of a hot topic at the moment. And then we have a couple of really cool other footwear studies and uh, some surface and speed interaction studies uh, with loading variables and variable technology and all this stuff. So uh, some fun stuff coming around. So it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting summer to get those out for sure. So stay tuned, jump over, follow uh, Max at Biomax on Twitter. And Max, we do wish to invite you back for an expert edition around running surface interactions. It's, it's, it's an often misunderstood area mm-hmm. and often over-attributed, I find. So it'd be great to, uh, to feature you again in the, in the coming uh, months, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just this is great, Brad. I appreciate the, uh, the invite and... Uh, like I said, it's really cool to, to be on, on the podcast after it being my first one uh, uh, <laughs> two years ago. So thanks again for the invite. Max, thanks for your contribution. And it's late your time. Uh, go and uh, bank the work you've done today. It's the response that matters, right? Exactly. We'll see you tomorrow. I'll, give you, I'll let you know tomorrow how I respond. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Max. <laughs> no problem. So there you have it, another expert edition of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust and I know you enjoyed Max's sharings. Now, as I mentioned, Max is a great and must follow over on Twitter. If you are a practitioner, coach, or athlete, you'll find lots of great resources and commentary from Max over on Twitter at BiomechMax. That's Biomech, B I O. M-E-C-H, Max, M-A-X, over on Twitter. And do let Max know what it was that you enjoyed from his sharings. Now, if you'd like to tag the show in on social media, you can do so to search The Physical Performance Show and tag the show in with the podsies, a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying, and we'll reshare that. And it's a whole lot of fun to see those coming through. Any feedback regarding the show, you're always welcome to send that off to me direct at Brad underscore beer on Instagram or Twitter or b.beer, B-E-E-R, at pogophysio.com.au via email. Massive thanks, as always, to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes and for those hitting subscribe. Big shout-out again to this week's show sponsor, Precision Hydration. If you are yet to take that online free sweat test, then get moving. Do so. Find out how much salt is in your sweat and then plan your best hydration strategy with Precision Hydration's very generous free offer to help and get it right in training, and then get it right on game day, race day. If you'd like to support production of the show, then that is fantastic. It helps the quality of the show be sustained and outputted weekly. We often say podcasts, whilst free to download, are not free to produce, so any support is greatly appreciated and can be done easily over on Patreon. Just search The Physical Performance Show, and in return, we'll grant you access to our back catalogue of live stream events and, of course, our upcoming live stream events, including, with the date soon to be confirmed, 
Rinny McGregor with a deep dive on all things fueling for performance. If you missed Rinny's expert edition, then it has been incredibly popular. Episode 258, Fueling for Health and Performance. It has received a lot of feedback and we know it'll be a very popular live stream. So stay tuned for the release of the date for that. Massive thanks as always to the great team who put this show together week in, week out. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration and Matthew Walding on all things show graphic design. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, I was actually put to the test and put behind the microphone by Hamish Vickerman, founder of the Fasciitis Fighter, to share some practical tips around navigating running injuries. So we discussed how common running injuries are, the known causes of running injuries, how to navigate the common bone, tendon and joint related concerns with the aim of educating you around how to best try and prevent running injuries and deal with a running injury if and when it does occur. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.